So very good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the day two and the keynote for today, Trends on International Student Mobility, a Long-Term Global Perspective. I would like to welcome you. My name is Apoorv Mahendru. I am the Deputy Director of the DAAD Regional Office in New Delhi. And uh, also on screen, you can see Professor Dr. Deutschmann, who will be doing, uh, holding his keynote lecture in a little while from now, just to be sure uh, all the participants have the option to write some questions into the chat. Professor Deutschmann has said that he would be happy to answer a couple of questions towards the end of his talk. So please do feel free to just um, write your questions into the chat window anytime during the presentation. Of course, we will address them only once it's over. So as I said, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Emanuel Deutschmann. <clears throat> He's an assistant professor of sociological theory at the University of Flensburg in Germany, and also an associate at the European University Institute's Migration Policy Center in Florence in Italy. His research, which he'll also be sharing with us here today, focuses on social networks of transnational mobility and processes of regionalization and globalization. He has written a book, a very latest book, which is titled Mapping the Transnational World, How We Move and Communicate Across Borders and Why It Matters, been published by Princeton University Press. I'm sure very interesting read. I have not had the opportunity to read it now, but definitely look forward to that. And in today's session, Dr. Deutschmann will be talking about uh, global international student mobility. The fact that it has enormously increased, of course, over the decades is something we know, but he will delve a little more into statistics and share some interesting insights as to the growth rates, how they tend to exceed those of many other forms of mobility, like migration and tourism. And he will draw on a lot of data material and visualization during his talk, where he'll try to illustrate some of the salient features or trends of global mobility over the past 60 years, starting from 1960 till date. And uh, I think I'll hand over the word now to Dr. Deutschmann and request him to please share his screen and start with the talk. Over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction and the invitation. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to, to be here today and to have the opportunity to present my work. And I'm very much looking forward to this opportunity and also the chance to um, discuss uh, um, my presentation with you. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I start right away. As you can see, I've prepared this talk on the topic of trends in international student mobility, a long term uh, global perspective. And um, my goal here today is really to describe the global structure of international student mobility in its development between 1960 and 2010. And uh, yes, uh, this is my main source, as uh, was just kindly mentioned, um, um, my book, Mapping the Transnational World, um, uh, where I, um, yeah, uh, base my, um, the, the, the slides um, that I present today are based on, the, on this book, basically. Um, so I will talk, of course, about uh, student mobility, but um, as was kindly mentioned already, I will uh, also look at it in comparison with other types of international mobility, such as migration, refuge seeking, tourism, but also even communication like uh, Facebook friendships, remittances and phone calls to really uh, test uh, how student mobility is unique in comparison to other types of international mobility. Um, my main arguments today are uh, first that international student mobility has seen remarkable growth over time. Second, that uh, international student mobility is exceptional in its high degree of globalization, which really makes it a unique type of mobility between countries. And that third, uh, despite this global growth, international student mobility remains highly unequal. Now, um, of course, you're all experts and practitioners in this field, so maybe none of these three points is, is particularly new to you, but I hope that still um, uh, illustrating these points in some detail um, can be a useful exercise. Uh, at least that's my hope for today. Um, so let me start right away with this first point. International student mobility has seen remarkable growth. And here I want to show, show you just two maps that really illustrate this point. So um, this first map shows uh, international student mobility um, in, uh, in 1960 illustrated on a world map. And as you can see, 
Um, there's quite a few connections already at, and, and these connections are quite global um, even at this point. But this is uh, what the picture looks like in, in 2010. And I think um, the contrast between these two maps really couldn't be clearer. Um, and uh, so this illustrates how student mobility has grown enormously over time. This is also shown with some more context in this graph, uh, which shows uh, the growth of various types of mobility uh, and even communication over time from 1960 to 2010. And we see the number of students and other forms of mobility relative to their value in 2010. Um, and as you can see, student mobility is one of the steepest growth curve curves um, of all types of activities. So it has grown very fast and faster than tourism, for example, a lot faster than migration and a lot faster than refugees also. And it has grown a lot faster than the world population also, which is not true, for example, for migration, but for students, uh, it really holds. Um, only international phone calls have grown a bit faster than students, but otherwise, compared to other types of uh, mobility, uh, it's it's really a very fast growing um, uh, type of activity. You can also fit an exponential growth curve here and it fits very well. So uh, in summary, student mobility has really grown exponentially. It has grown faster than other types of mobility and it has grown faster than the world population. Um, now you may wonder, okay, but why does it matter? Um, why should we care? Um, and yes, I'm a sociologist by training. I'm a social scientist and a social scientist. We can, of course, draw on theories. And um, in this case, intergroup contact theory and transactionalist theory are um, relevant theories because they both argue that international contact leads to, in the best case, leads to um, peaceful relations, the development of some kind of uh, sense of community, of mutual understanding and of solidarity. Um, and so if this holds, if uh, international mobility grows faster than the world population grows very fast and contributes to connecting countries um, by bringing people into interaction, then this could be, according to these theories, a source of um, new understanding, new solidarity. Um, so moving on to my second point, um, which uh, states that international student mobility is exceptional in its high degree of globalization. Um, now, this point is a bit more complex than the first one. Um, so I will now make a small excursion, which may be a bit surprising at first, because I will now move on to this shark. Um, this shark is a hungry shark and it's uh, swimming in the ocean, um, searching for prey. So it swims around a bit and it encounters a swarm of fish uh, and it begins to hunt around in that area, swimming around over short distances in this area. Um, and after a while, it swims away again over a long distance into new territory. Uh, there it encounters again a swarm of fish, swims around in that area, then over a longer distance again, and so on and so forth. Now, there are ecologists who have, who are interested in understanding the movement patterns of sharks and other animals, and they have used a mathematical model known as the random walk, um, which you can see here, to predict the movements of sharks and other species. As you look, as you can see here, these two patterns look a bit similar. Um, and when you take the moves, um, in such a random walk and you sort them by frequency and size, you end up with a probability distribution that looks like this. So on this axis, you have the distance and on this axis, you have the probability of a move to occur. And you can see that short moves are very frequent and uh, then the longer the distance, uh, the, un the more unlikely a move becomes. Uh, and this is in line uh, with this pattern, lots of short moves, very few, um, distant moves. Now, when you take just the tail of this distribution, um, it looks like this. So just the part from this top here, you end up with a curve that looks like this, and this is called a power law curve. This pattern is known as the levy fly power law model of mobility. Uh, and it looks like this. So you don't have to remember this formula, but just keep in mind this curve uh, because it will uh, become important on in the following slides. Um, 
So this is a model of mobility where short moves are very frequent and long moves are, are, are very rare uh, in comparison. Now this pattern, this Levy Fly power law pattern has been shown not only to describe the moves of sharks in the ocean really well, but also of other marine predators like penguins and sea turtles, uh, mammals, uh, uh, land mammals like uh, spider monkeys, but also smaller species like plankton. Uh, and then complexity scientists have taken this model and applied it to human mobility uh, at the local scale and have shown that within cities, uh, humans moving around also follow this power law pattern. Uh, and then in one study, they followed US do dollar bills in the United States and showed that at the national scale, this model also describes mobility very well. And I was wondering, does this also apply to transnational, to international human mobility at the global scale? And this is exactly what I examined. Um, and here are some distributions, again, looking at, uh, again at this in a comparative way across various types of mobility. Again, on, on, on this axis, you have the distance ranging from zero to 20,000 kilometers, which would be basically moving to the other side of the globe. And then on this axis, again, you have the probability of such a movement to occur. And you see that for refugees, you have um, the, uh, dots, the blue dots are the empirical observations and the um, black line is this power law curve as you just saw in the previous slide. And we see here that um, for refugees, this fits almost perfectly. So refugees move very closely at sh uh, short distances and then the probability of a move uh, declines very quickly as uh, distance increases. And it also holds very well for tourism. It also holds very well for asylum seeking. It also holds very well for migration. But the only type where this power law pattern uh, does not apply well um, is student exchange. Um, so here we have a very exceptional pattern um, where in the beginning at very short distances, um, student mobility is also very likely kind of in line with the other patterns. But then you have in, at this middle range distances uh, of around 10,000 kilometers, you also have a lot of mobility. Uh, and that makes international student mobility really exceptional in that it breaks this quasi universal uh, power law structure that um, determines a lot of types of international human mobility and also the movements of other uh, animal species on this planet. Uh, and the question, of course, is why does that happen? What explains this ex exceptionality of international student mobility? And you, you find some uh, cues on, on, on this slide, on this map, which shows that when you look again at these uh, exceptional spikes in this pattern at these medium range distances, you can see that they all correspond to um, specific to moves between specific country pairs, which are actually the largest flows of international student mobility worldwide. And um, they are illustrated also in this map. And you can see that most of them are movements between countries with a very large population, such as China and India, on the one hand, uh, ascending countries and um, countries with uh, universities with very high international reputation, such as the US, the UK and Australia. Um, so these major moves between these country pairs um, are really the ones um, that explain these unusual spikes in the medium uh, distances. So I think one major explanation for this exceptionality is the, the, the stratification of institutional reputation in the international university system that does not really apply to these other types of uh, mobility where you have the possibility to, for example, as a tourist to um, go to any other neighboring country um, and uh, go on a nice holiday, which is not really possible when you have a very stratified reputation system as you have in uh, with international universities. Um, and uh, this pattern, of course, also implies that international student mobility is more globalized than the other types of uh, mobility. Uh, and this is also illustrated in this graph, which shows again the longitudinal perspective. The top graph um, you have already seen uh, in, in slightly altered form. You see again the stark increase in the numbers of international student mobility and other types of mobility. And uh, in this bottom graph, you see now a different indicator. You see 
the share of international mobility that occurs over relatively short distances. So that remains within the first 5,000 kilometers. And you can see here, um, these triangles are student mobility that for the whole time period from 1960 to 2010, basically always about 50% of all student mobility um, occurred within the first 5,000 kilometers. So it's not that this is something new. So it's not that um, student mobility globalized faster than other types of activity. Rather, student mobility has always been a very globalized form of mobility. Whereas uh, these other types of mobility have, are also very stable. For example, 75% um, or 80% of migrants move short distance and even higher rates for, uh, stu for tourists and refugees. Um, this is a lot lower for tourism. Uh, for, for student exchange. So it's a very globalized form of mobility and it always has been a very globalized form of mobility in contrast to other forms of mobility. So in this case, in this sense, uh, student mobility is really uh, quite exceptional uh, in, in comparison. Okay, so let's move on to my third point, which is that despite this global growth and uh, despite the, the global distribution of international student mobility, student mobility remains highly unequal. Um, and I want to start by just giving you one figure that maybe you, you know all also from your own work and other contexts. Um, so only five countries receive more than 50% of all international students. Um, these countries you see on this on, on this map here, the United States, the UK, Australia, France, and Germany. And this is, of course, uh, already a first indicator of high inequality. So you would, of course, expect five countries to receive 5% of all international students in an equal distribution, but it's more than 50%. And a few years ago, it was even more than 60%. Um, so high inequality and another way to look at it, uh, at this inequality is by drawing on the Gini coefficient. Maybe you have heard of the Gini coefficient in the context of income inequality. It's a very common measure to uh, to illustrate inequality. And uh, the Gini coefficient can have in, it, in its extremes, it can have a, ma a value of one, which would mean perfect inequality. In our case here, if the Gini was one, all students, sorry, all students would just move between one pair of countries while no students would move between any other countries uh, on earth. And the other extreme would be perfect equality, a gene of zero where the same number of students would move between uh, any country pair on earth. And um, this is what the actual genies look like for international mobility. You see the student mobility globally uh, in green. It has a genie of 0.92, which is very close to this maximum of one. So this means that students move just between a very small number of country pairs globally, and, and it's a very, very unequal distribution. So drawing again on the comparison to income inequality, here the genie usually lies between 0.3 and 0.6. So it's a, a, loss, a lot less unequal. So um, we see that all these types of international mobility are very uh, unequally distributed and student mobility is no exception here. And again, remember uh, intergroup contact theory and transactionalist theory. Uh, if you take these theories seriously, then this really is important and matters because if students only move between a small number of country pairs globally, but not between the others, then the chances of developing a sense of community and developing solidarity are really also restricted uh, to these country pairs. Um, so from the perspective of these theories, this is certainly uh, a, a non-ideal uh, situation, this uh, extreme degree of inequality. Um, this is um, um, the degree of inequality of student mobility within regions. So for example, here, student mobility within Europe and student mobility within Asia. And we see that also within continents, the distribution is quite unequal. It's not as extreme as it is here globally, but it's still very, very unequal. And even within regions, um, student mobility um, could be a lot more equally distributed. Um, 
this is uh, uh, an example from the case of Europe. Uh, this is another way of looking at uh, inequality. Um, this is the Lorentz curve, which is a visual representation of the Gini coefficient. Uh, for this Lorentz curve, uh, you could have a line that runs along the diagonal, which would be perfect equality. And the uh, other extreme would be perfect inequality when the line uh, is in this right bottom corner. And uh, here we see incoming students within Europe and outgoing students within Europe. And we see here that from 1960, which is this black dotted line to 2015, the line did move more towards the diagonal. Uh, and so this shows, and this holds both for incoming and outgoing students. So we can see that over time, student mobility within Europe seems to have become a bit more equally distributed across countries. Um, but you can also see that it's still far away from this uh, diagonal of perfect equality. So while Europe uh, or mobility within Europe seems to be on the right path, so to speak, um, towards more equality of student mobility, um, it still has a long way to go as well. Finally, I want to show you um, another indicator of inequality or another yeah, maybe reason or um, determinant of inequality in student mobility, which is the costs um, um, that come with student mobility. Um, here I draw on um, a, a work from a project. I, I, I worked in the Global Mobilities Project where we created a new data set, the Global Mobilities Project's Global Visa Cost data set, where we collected information on the visa costs of traveling from one country to another, um, depending on the type of uh, activity. So again, tourism, business, work visas, family reunifications, and student visas were part uh, of the information we collected. And um, I want to just show you the um, global inequality when it comes to getting uh, a, a visa for a student, um, for the mobility of a student um, to go abroad to another country. And you see here um, the visa costs um, averages depending on which region you come from. Uh, and you see here the, the costs are uh, converted to US dollars. Um, so this graph shows that when you come from Western, Northern or Southern Europe, um, or let's restrict it to Western and Northern Europe, you pay about 50, 42, 44 uh, US dollars. Um, if you want to get a visa, uh, paying for a visa to another country, so the average of other countries. Um, however, if you come from uh, um, uh, Central Asia, for example, or Southern Asia, you pay on average more than $100, uh, which is already uh, very in, uh, unequal. It's uh, more than double the price that um, people from Western Europe pay on average. Uh, and this does not into, take into account uh, uh, even um, that, of course, the standards of living in these countries are very uh, different. And this is something that we can also take into account. So on the right hand side, you now see um, the student visa costs by sender region in average daily incomes. So this basically shows how long do you have to work on average um, to be able, if you earn the uh, average income of that country, to be able to afford um, a, a visa for going abroad. And as you can see, this gradient has become a lot bigger even. So um, if you come from Europe, from Northern America, Australia, and New Zealand, the costs for a visa, a student visa to go abroad um, are basically um, less, uh, just a small fraction of uh, an average daily income. Whereas in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's uh, uh, more than a month and in Southeastern Asia, it's 12 days. In Central Asia, it's uh, 19 days. And in Southern Asia, Asia it's uh, 25 days. Um, and of course, at these um, high costs, uh, student visas often become prohibit prohibitively high. Um, so that's another indicator of extreme inequality. And of course, such high costs can also be um, uh, an important obstacle that uh, hinders student mobility. Um, here you see this relation, which is a bit paradox also, if you think about it, again, illustrated uh, in, a, in a graph. You see on this axis, the student visa costs in US dollar, and here you see the gross national income of per capita of uh, the sender countries. So 
um, basically the uh, uh, average income level of that country. And you see that it's a negative relation. So basically the richer the country, the less people from that country have to pay for student visa. Um, and we call this the Matthew effect of visa costs. Um, I don't know if you have heard this uh, Matthew effect before. It's a term coined by uh, Robert K. Merton in the 1960s. Uh, using work also from his wife, Harriet Suckerman, both were sociologists. Um, and um, they argued that in science, um, people who are already famous um, become more famous just by being famous already. And here we argue that we have a similar effect for visa costs in that when they want to go abroad, the poor get poorer and the rich stay rich. So it's really um, a paradox situation um, that contributes and uh, stabilizes um, patterns of inequality. So yes, that was the third point I wanted to make. Um, and I come now to my summary. We have seen that over the last decades, international student mobility has grown exponentially. It has grown faster than the world population and most other types of mobility. Um, then we have seen that international student mobility is really exceptional and unique in that it is more globalized than other types of mobility and breaks this power law pattern um, that is usually uh, visible for most types of mobility. Um, and we have seen also that uh, the uh, stratification of reputation system of universities um, may be a major factor that uh, leads to this exceptionality. Um, then we have seen that international student mobility is uh, distributed extremely unequally. Most students move between a small number of country pairs. And then finally, uh, differences in opportunity. Um, students from poorer countries typically have to pay more for student visas, which um, also contributes to this high degree of inequality that we have seen before. Um, Final slide, um, I think if intergroup contact theory and transactionalist theory uh, are right in that, um, and, and the empirical literature really demonstrates that it is right, that more contact, uh, more interaction across national border leads to more sense of communi community and more understanding and more solidarity. There's plenty of studies that uh, show that and you can see some of them listed here. So if these theories are right, uh, then more international mobility by students that is distributed more equally across a larger number of countries can really lead to more sense of community, more solidarity and more mutual understanding across borders. Um, and um, that's my, my final slide. Um, I want to thank you so much for your attention and um, I also very much look forward to any comments or questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deutschmann. Really interesting presentation, very compelling. And I could make that out by the number of questions that have been flowing in. So even though I said just one or two questions, maybe I'll take a few more than that because they are really interesting. I request you to keep your answers brief, just answer in a line or two if possible, that would be great. And um, the first question we have is from Gopi Nathan asking, um, what do you have to say about gender, age, race, class, sexual orientation, disability, these factors vis-a-vis -vis student mobility. Are there any studies that are being done? Are you aware of something? Um, yes, very good question. So um, this is something, so all these individual characteristics, which of course matter and are highly important, are something that are rather uh, invisible in my work because I, I draw on these really macro analyses, global analyses, where I also draw on data that is just uh, highly aggregated. So I only have information on the number of students, but not the individual characteristics. So this is un unfortunately something that can be better addressed in, in qualitative studies, small scale studies that, that focus, but it's not something I can really do. So and yeah, I think my approach has some advantages, but it also has the disadvantage that, that these characteristics become kind of invisible. Thank you so much for this. Another question by Mr. Wagenfeld says, uh, are there trends of decreasing inequality of student exchange in the past, which go beyond Europe? You showed an example of Europe that there might be trends of decreasing inequality. In any other parts of the world, are there studies that tend to support or contradict that statement that you might be aware of? Um, so I, 
Um, I don't know of any studies. I think this is something that has really not been looked at a lot. And it's something actually I, I plan to explore a bit more because I only looked at this. Um, so the things I showed you globally um, are only data from 2010. And I never looked, I could do this, I have the data, but I didn't look at this for the regions individually um, over time. But it's something I want to do in the future and that should be done because I think it's an interesting question. But another problem is um, that you have to um, check if the data became more complete as more countries um, added data on the student mobility um, or if it's actually an increase in inequality. So that's, it's, uh, it's something that should be explored more, but I'm not aware of any studies that show that uh, already for other world regions. But Thank it's a you. very another, interesting point. Another question which may not be directly relevant to your work, but I'll still pose it. It was the first one that came in. Um, Mr. Seva Perumal was asking about mobility and, and that the fact that it is unequal in terms of bilateral mobility is mostly unequal. There are more people going from South Asia, let's say, to Europe and uh, North America than the other way around. So what, what are some of the ways or what are some probable reasons how one could improve um, and make this more bi-directional, let's uh, make it a little more balanced. Um, yeah, it's a very good question and uh, of course an important problem. It's very true. Most of these networks are highly uh, unbalanced in terms of the two directions, um, which is uh, unfortunate, uh, especially in student mobility. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm really um, the best person to address this. I think there are practitioners who are probably more experienced in uh, actual possibilities. Maybe one comment based on the visa um, requirements. So I think here really one possibility is to, so one important factor we see in the visa network is uh, reciprocity. So when one country um, uh, drops uh, the requirement of a visa, then the, uh, uh, in one direction, then the other country often re re applies reciprocity and also drops the visa cost. So yeah, bilateral ag agreements are probably an important means of uh, yeah increasing um, yeah movements in both directions. But I'm I'm not an expert on on this actually. Yeah, there are very many other questions also flowing on, all really interesting. But I will have to make a stop here with one last question, maybe uh, because we have another session coming up after this one also, and this is in direction digitalization. Right now we're doing this conference online, so. What do you think is going to be the effect of digitalization, online studies on physical mobility of students in the future? Mm -hmm. um, also a very good question. I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity, but um, what we see in mind, uh, not talking not about student mobility, but about, uh, as, you, as you saw, one of the networks I examined is the Facebook friendship networks, which is also digital network, right? It's uh, online friendships. And yet for for these Facebook friendships, we also see that the distribution in space is also follows this power law distribution, unlike the student mobility. So often these digital networks um, um, are determined by space, just like physical mobility. So um, this makes me a bit skeptical and brings an element of skepticism. Um, so I think um, digitalization is important and it can uh, increase participation as this conference greatly illustrates, but at the same time, it does not really um, make us all detach from spatial constraints. It's, it's not, it may be a game changer, but it, it, it doesn't eliminate all spatial constraints, but it's, I think it's a great opportunity and um, yeah, this conference is a prime example. Thank you so much, Dr. Deutschmann, for all the wonderful insights, the interesting points you raised, which got us all thinking and asking all sorts of questions. It was really interesting. Once again, a big thank you from the organizers for being here and delivering this, this awesome presentation for us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's great pleasure. Thank you also to all the participants for joining and for asking these questions. I once again apologize for not being able to ask all the questions here in this half an hour session that we have. But it's a great opportunity for you through our platform over the next couple of days also to get in contact with one another individually for B2B meetings where I think you have more time to sort out some of these issues. And I'd like to just point your attention to the next session that's coming up in another 20 minutes or so that will be dealing with the internationalization of higher education institutions by 2030. So maybe a 
forward looking question how are things likely to change in the coming eight ten years show sure, going to be a very interesting session also we look forward to all of you joining us in that session later on so thank you for being with us and wish you a fruitful conference ahead thank you and bye-bye thank you